The All Women exhibition is a much deb deb debated curatorial strategy. As you know, it was developed in the 70s during the second wave feminism, then it fell out of flavor in the 80s and 90s, and it is now, now flourishing again. An example of this is the feminist art coalition involving 50 museums in the US now to help promote feminist art exhibitions, performances, and programs ahead of the presidential election in 2020, for example. In Norway, the past decades, a decade has seen an impressive uh, range of all women exhibitions, such as Hol Sten, Heart Fast på Greiadi, and uh, The Beginning is Always Today. In addition, we've had uh, several solo exhibitions with so called forgotten women, as you can see here on the screen, by Siri Erdal, Charlotte Wankel, Sissel Påske, Hanna Ryggen, also Texmon Rygg that Sigrun talked about, Irma Salo Jäger and Stenka Rosova, just to mention a few. So it's very much, uh, yeah, it's very much uh, an issue sort of in Norwegian contemporary art now. Um, and as you know, the all women exhibitions are always met by two conflicting dichotomous positions. On the one hand, the all women exhibition is seen to marginalize, to pigeonhole and to isolate women artists from the movements and influences that they, they have been a part of. As this critic in uh, Art News says that creating pink ghettos within the art world rather than simply making a conscious effort to include a diverse group of artists in all exhibitions simply furthers the nasty perception problem that work created by a woman is somehow inherently different from that created by a man. On the other hand, all women exhibitions are seen as essential, as necessary corrections to the male canon. Um, it's only by to, you know, it's only by sort of being an, a feminist activist that one can um, issue, uh, make these issues as identity, uh, sexuality, politics and history uh, as issues in order to sort of change the canon as um, Ma Maura Riley has uh, debated in her recent book, Curatorial Activism from 2018. So my question then is in this paper is how then should we, uh, you know, approach this is issue? How should we include women in the canon? Is it necessary to organize all women exhibitions? How should it be done? So in this paper, which is, a, uh, I, I examined two exhibitions um, that I thought were interesting because they have two quite different strategies. Um, I consider these two Norwegian contemporary exhibitions and discuss their curatorial and feminist strategies. It's the Eva Bullholte and Marta Lese Strandbrug Gallery at Galleri Ram to the left, and then Like Betsy at the Northern Norway Art Exhibitions. And in this work, I, uh, I talked to curator Joachim Borda Pereira and uh, Charis Gulliksen. Um, so I'm sort of presenting their views. I'm not myself a curator. I'm not a researcher really of contemporary art. I'm, I work as an art critic. So this is something I think about a lot. How, how, how should we include women? Sort of, it's a sort of case study. And I will start first by showing you some pictures and talking about the exhibition at the Ram Gallery, which was um, uh, opened this August, in, from yeah, August to September 2019. Um, and this exhibition was an initiative uh, be, uh, between the private gallery RAM and uh, the Nordic Institute of Art, whom um, some of you might know, led by K Knut Jögot, and the Eva Bullholte Museum and Memorial Foundation in Telemark. So three institutions were part of this exhibition. And its scope was to call attention to the um, forgotten modernist uh, artist Eva Bullholte, um, who we see a painting by here. Um, but instead of creating a one-woman show, the curatorial strategy that was chosen was that of a visual dialogue between the art of Eva Bullholte here and a contemporary artist called Marte Lise Stramrud. Um, and in the catalogue forward to the uh, exhibition, uh, Joachim Borda Pedreira stresses that the gallery appreciates dialogue as a curatorial foundation, and he sees this exhibition as an example of how contemporary art may communicate with historical art. So interestingly, his text, in his text, there's no mention of a feminist or an activist position. Uh, the exhibition is presented as a dialogue between uh, two non-gendered artists, and the stress is placed on how they relate to one another, uh, particularly, you know, aesthetically. Uh, Eva Bullholte, she 
uh, was educated at the Norwegian Arts and Crafts School in Oslo, at the National Academy. She was a student at the Ecole de Beaux Arts, and she was a, a pupil of uh, Per Krog and Jean Heiberg, two famous Norwegian Matisse pupils. Uh, and as you see, she's represented in a lot of um, uh, collections and galleries. Uh, but you could say that she has, in the Norwegian art historical canon, virtually no place. Uh, she, you know, if you, yeah, you can hardly find anything about her. And part of this is that the museum dedicated to her work is uh, found in Åmotsdal, in eastern Telemark, about three, four hours drive from Oslo on a road that goes like this. So it's and it's only open two weeks in the summer. So um, yeah, part of this is also you know, geographical concerns. But I'm just showing you some of these pictures. Um, she was also, um, during the war, she was uh, head designer for a ceramics factory. And this is what leads us to, you know, the juxtaposition with Marta Lise Stramru. She, on her hand, is a progressive young artist. She has a master de master's degree from Oslo National Academy of Arts. She's trained as a painter, as a photographer, but now mainly works as a ceramic artist. She makes these uh, very uh, sort of uh, colorful, naive style objects of, uh, you know, cups and pegs and trays painted with strong, fresh colors. And she is a very, you can see how she has a very sort of visible, tactile, quirky style. I, I really like her. Um, um, so in, in the exhibition, I'll just show you some of these, you know, some, some photos from the exhibition. We see that um, uh, the frames, most of the frames on Eva Bullholte's uh, art from the 50s are removed to give them this clean, non-historical feel. And you can see that uh, Stramrud's ceramics are displayed on industrial trolleys in the gallery space. So um, in the space, as you see, you get this idea of, um, uh, yeah, these two artists, you know, involved in dialogue across history, across aesthetics and materials and themes. And you can note also that there are no texts uh, on the walls. It's a very stripped uh, gallery space. Um, no, you know, no framing, no text. So it's, it's, yeah, it's sort of making use of the white cube and letting the aesthetic qualities uh, dominate. And this was also how it was received in the media, in the, by critics. Um, I'll just quote one critic who is called uh, Tiril uh, Flom. She says that um, the exhibition is structured so that these works talk together. Like chameleons, they mimic each other, respond to each other's characteristic. Small, cheerful conversations are, are created between the works, about friends, wine, about e everyday intimacy, about the lighter side of life. And this sort of this feel was also echoed in Klassekampen and also Mornblad. Nowhere did one talk about gender, no one did one, one talk about the forgotten Eva Bullholte, which just didn't exist. And I think that was what attracted to me to this exhibition because it was so non-gendered, even though being about gender. Um, and this, um, it's interesting, you know, this fact that it was not addressed in the exhibition, it was not addressed in the text accompanying the exhibition by the curator. Instead, it was discussed outside uh, the gallery. There was an... Um, in a larger part of the catalogue, his art historian Knut Jörgott talks about generally why an artist like Bull Holte, who was initially recognised in her day, was forgotten. And also the director of the Young Artist Society, Rea Dahl, talks about Marta Lise Stramru as a feminist, uh, as Rosemary Tröckel and Marta Rosler. So they're sort of written into a feminist uh, narrative by in this larger context. Also, there was a seminar, which I'll return to later, a whole day seminar, 5th of September, where we discussed forgot, for, for, forgotten women, sort of forgotten women in art history. But you could see that those, the people who didn't read the catalogue, who didn't visit the seminar, they would see this visual dialogue between, between the artists. And I talked about, uh, I talked about uh, this with the curator, and I asked him, about his strategies and his views on all women exhibitions generally. And yeah, um, Joachim 
what Dr. Pedreira said. He said, if we were subcommunicating that it was an exhibition with two women, it is because I am a little tired of exhibitions where different labels like women, African, gay, etc., are used as legitimation of an artist's relevance. The basis for the Bullholte Strambru compilation was not that they are both women, but that there were several parallels in their art that unite them. And he mentions. Um, Bullholte started as a potter, moved on to visual art. Stramru began as a visual artist, but switched to working exclusively with ceramics. Both also have in common that they're colorists with influences from French painting. Um, then I asked him, you know, this is, whoops. I also asked him about uh, aesthetics. You know, why this focus on, on, on the aesthetics? And he says that, um, you ask me about aesthetics, he said. I cannot create an art, art exhibition where the aesthetic qualities are not central. We work with visual arts and not community activism, he says. There I may be perceived as a conservative, but I will fight against the instrumentalization of art which will force art to be of benefit to society. I think that it is not on an institutional level and in the dissemination uh, no, I think that it, it, it is on an institutional level and in the dissemination that one has to um, work to make the art world less elitist. My experience is that if you want to reach groups that are not used to art, the aesthetic is just a good way because all people, regardless of background, corresponds to sensations of mind. This is his response. Um, I was present uh, at this one-day seminar, uh, 5th of September, um, I'll just show you, yeah, this is just the details of the seminar. Um, I gave a paper on the Norwegian modernist artist Else Kristi Kjellan, who's also a forgotten woman. Um, and I was also present during the panel discussion following this, this seminar. And it became a very, very heated debate, as this newspaper article in Minerva says. This is a uh, quarreling about uh, gender in the arts, it says in Norwegian. A full, yeah. A full-blown quarrel about gender in the art, he said. Um, it became very heated, and very, to me at least, surprisingly heated. Uh, Lotte Konovlun, who is a contemporary artist and curator, she talked about her experience of being a contemporary female artist in a very, yeah, a very activist <laughs> lecture. She said that um, she said that in Norwegian art life. Uh, we have a very long way to go before female artists are equal to male artists. And I quote her, women are not a subcultural group, half of us we are, which should of course be reflected in representations, in economics and in the canon. Um, and it's high time, she said. Uh, then art historian Dag Soljell, uh, who was present in the audience, he stood up and he scolded her, yelling nearly, this is something a man could never have said to a woman. Uh, and he said that he believed art life in Norway had become asymmetrical in women's favor. And he started listing up, you know, the, there's a woman directing this, there's a woman directing all, oh, you're all women. And it was really, really, really heated, um, heated uh, debate that really um, uh, shocked, shocked me at least. Um, and then I talked, you know, I reflected upon this and I, um, when preparing this lecture, I talked to Joachim Borda Pedreira again, and he said that um, he said that he re, uh, he said that they had had several very strong reactions after this seminar and from the audience visiting this exhibition. And I'll just yeah show you on screen what he said. He said that all male historians. Um, all male art historians over the age of 45 were still strongly negative to Bullholte after the exhibition and the seminar. He said, we received many angry comments privately in the mail after the seminar, perhaps extra provocative because Knut, Knut Jörgott, the he's the director of the Nordic Art Institute, um, because he fronted the project. Because why would he front that? I don't know if you know Knut, but he's fronted uh, Knut Board exhibition and he's now head of the Edward Burne Jones exhibition at Kode. So he's a very sort of yeah, good curator. But it was seen very, you know, as a provocation that he would support Eva Bullholte's 
Laosi, uh, <laughs> Laosi art historical um, project. Uh, and he says, it was very strange for both of us to be more or less designated as gender traitors because one dares to bring forth a female artist and ask for the responsibility of art history. So, and this is where I think it's interesting, he says, so I would say that it was a very political exhibition, but perhaps not in the way so-called political exhibitions often appear. Um, and I'll just leave that lingering when I move to <clears throat> my next case, which is the, uh, uh, the exhibition Like Betsy at Northern Nor Norway Art Museum, which just closed two, three weeks ago. Um, this is from the lobby. Um, and while the activist and feminist aspects, as we saw, were underplayed in the Eva Bull Holte exhibition, they were very much in focus in this exhibition called Like Betsy at the Northern Norwegian Art Museum. The exhibition, it um, focused on the female artist Betsy Akerslot Berg, who was uh, born in 1850 and lived until 1922, uh, who's a, um, a Norwegian landscape and marine painter with considerable success in her own time. And um, the exhibition had the scope, again, to sort of reinsert her into the canon, to focus on her role in Norwegian regional, uh, northern Norwegian art. Um, and the, the background for this was that the museum had organized several exhibitions on regional male artists, like Peder Balke, Otto Singding, Knut Bade, and now it was a place to talk about Betsy Akerslot Berg. Um, also, interestingly, by focusing on, on, on Betsy here, she's seen, Mm, by focusing on Betsy, the Art Museum furthermore wished to direct a critical focus on neglected stories also in general. Who is the like of Betsy today? That's why it's called Like Betsy. Who's, who's the like of Betsy today? What other stories have disappeared? Who else is multifaceted, engaged, talented, contradictory, but made one-dimensional? Um, and in the presentation, I'll just show you, this is a typical, you know, Betsy Akerslot bad painting. She's a m marine, uh, yeah, she paints uh, seascapes and she paints, uh, you know, uh, coastal nights, etc. Um, and has a, a large, uh, she, she's very well, very well known. She has a museum in the Netherlands where her, about 300 of her works are collected. But in northern Norway, where she painted, she's practically, you know, disappeared. Um, and if we look at how the museum presents Betsy, it's very interesting. They say, uh, Betsy Akerslot Barrick, she was a badass marine painter, island queen, globetrotter, who went her own way, a path that always led her to the sea, <laughs> her only major passion. An artistic success, success in her day, but an obscurity in Norwegian art history. It's quite interesting. And it's uh, accompanied by these photos where we see Betsy, She's drinking wine inside the, the jaw of a whale. And we can see she's painting outdoors. She had constructed this artist studio box that she brought all her you know, stuff with her. She was sitting there with the wind, the rain, the pouring, and she was, you know, with her Sid vest. She's really a cool, badass painter. And also in the exhibition, we can see that she painted on uh, the things she found, this is a, a shoulder bone from a whale where she made the seedscape. Uh, she also made driftwood frames for her, her work, so on. So, you know, they get this, this yeah, this is very much reflected in the exhibition. Um, and uh, you could say that in contrast to the Ram exhibition, the Like Betsy exhibition does not follow a traditional curat curatorial museum design. And I talked to uh, Charisse Gullikson, who is the curator of the exhibition, and she said that she had seen the retrospective exhibition of Kitty Kjellan that toured Norway last year, and she didn't feel that it made any great difference, she said. It didn't mean anything. Um, it was just a series of beautiful oil paintings on the wall by a dead female artist. How could one make an exhibition that made people in general reflect on gender and gender equality in both art and society? This is what they, you know, they set out to do. How could one make Betsy Akerslot Berg's art and destiny matter? This is you know, the quest they had. So they decided against a traditional white cube exhibition um, where you could exhibit, you know, get all the Betsy Akerslot paintings and just show them in a timeline like you normally do. They didn't want to do that. Uh, they decided instead to choose a completely different curatorial strategy. And it's interesting that they worked in a curatorial team, 
with the, um, uh, the educator, the museum educator, the exhibition designer, and the curator together, and they decided to approach the story of Betsy from different angles. Um, so you can say that the exhibition was then sort of constructed around about 10, 15 of Betsy Akerslotberg's paintings, um, but then decided to employ different feminist strategies. And uh, I've grouped them into five. I'll just go through them uh, now. The first, uh, the first sort of feminist strategy that I've uh, looked at was what they call hacks. They decided to place hardcore facts on white pieces of paper with slogans from the art world, documenting the conditions of women artists to make people see the gender bias in the art world. Um, things like this, 75 to 90 percent of the monthly ads for solo exhibitions, uh, you know, is made by men, etc. This painting is the only artwork of Betsy Akerslotberg in Nordnorsk Kunstmuseum's collection. So they even hack their own uh, project, you know, they even attack their own curatorial, curatorial strategy. So she says that um, by hacking their own exhibition, they wanted to, t to take an active part in institutional criticism within and as Nunosh Kunstmuseum is part of the art institution, it is also a part of the problem, so they also hack their own uh, exhibition. So this is sort of the first, first curatorial strategy. The second one, um, the second activist and feminist strategy was um, the insertion of Betsy Akerslotberg into her contemporary artistic context, which is much used, of course. Um, a common feature with so-called unknown female artists is that they are often met with skepticism and defined as less skilled than the more famous male artists of their historical time. So thus the curators made an effort to, uh, to exhibit and compare her with um, other contemporary artists like Elisabeth Sinding, Henrik Willed Mestak, Adelsten Norman Christian Krog, Peder Balke, to show that she painted quite like the other artists of her time. And they even chose a quite sort of bad painting by Krista, which is this marine painting, which is a horrible painting, just to show that in a way she was sort of better than Christian Krog, the national hero Christian Krog. Uh, another grip they did, or another sort of um, strategy they did, was that they um, mentioned the, the names of the men, male artists in their uh, exhibition with their, um, uh, with their f how do you say, four names? Their four none, yeah. The first name, thank you, first names. Like Otto, Otto Sinding, he was just Otto. Uh, they write, in 1885, Betsy moved to Munich to study with Otto, for instance. Also, this is a slide showing that they, they mapped uh, Betsy's trip. Trips, you know, you can see that while Peder Balke, who is the green line up there, and Otto Sinding is the other green line, they only made two trips to Northern Norway. Betsy was there all the time. She made more than 20 trips. So. Isn't she actually the you know, most important regional painter you know, compared to this? Also, the exhibition was inspired by Betsy's story and her home and outdoor environment. So they had gathered, if you saw that, they had gathered old furniture uh, as this chaise longue and a desk. And they used old brittle porcelain in the cafe area. So it would be like drinking coffee with Betsy. Uh, and for, because Betsy had organized girl lounge salons where she taught young girls to embroider. So a visit to the museum would be like visiting her home. Also, they echoed the sort of the tough outdoor milieu that Betsy painted in by making these benches you saw um, in Driftwood so the audience could sit down in a sort of Betsy-like environment. Um, and also the exhibition included a copy, here you see the studio box, they also included a copy of her uh, studio box which she used when she painted her plein air paintings. And the audience could actually open the box, enter it to imagine how it would be to be Betsy, to sit there and be her. And she would write the races red flag to signal that she was done and needed help to come home. So it was all very authentic. Um, and as part of the last, uh, the last strategy that the museum made, there was to make a, a use of uh, outdoor activism. Um, as a part of their exhibition, they mounted a wooden box. Can you see that? There's a wooden box around the statue. They mounted a wooden box, which was similar to the one used by Betsy Akerslotberg when she painted. They mounted, mounted that around the polar, the statue of the polar hero, Roald Amundsen, who is a very treasured national hero in Norway. And this installation was called 
Han Roald som Betsy. And for those of you who know, know the Norwegian, it's a very familiar using his, not just Roald, but Han Roald. It's sort of very familiar and local. It's you know, Roald, yeah. Um, the installation was called Roald as Betsy and was an attempt to shed light on the uneven balance between named men and named women honored with statues in public space in Tromsø. Because in Tromsø there are no statues of female, famous female uh, um, uh, yeah, people, no, of women generally. There are no very few names after female uh, you know, writers, etc. It's a very sort of very masculine public space. And uh, in an article in the paper i Tromsø, the curatorial team um, stated the follow following about this intervention of Roal. You can have this picture. They said, this isn't about Roal. This isn't about Roal Amundsen. He is in this context only a representative of men on plinths. We would have done the same if the statue outside the museum was by Nansen, Adolf Thomsen, or King Håkon. We want to create a room where there is room for both Roal and Betsy, Wonny and Cora and Elsa Laula. The project is not a simple stunt to raise awareness about the Northern Norwegian Art Museum. It is dissemination of the themes we want to highlight with the exhibition. Um, the stunt created an extremely heated debate in Tromsø during the exhibition period, with angry letters in the papers, on Facebook, public debates, and it even resulted in vandalism. When the Betsy box that was surrounded the statue of resistance hero Otto Fleischer was demolished by an angry man, man in Harstad this summer. Um, it, also, the box that surrounded Roald Amundsen was attacked, and the art installation was also reported to the police as vandalism. And I've been following this case, you know, throughout the autumn, and it's been, yeah, it's been really crazy the debate that this exhibition has has, has caused because they entered the public space, sort of, they end with with this gender statement. So I'm reaching my conclusion now. Um, concluding reflections, I would just call them. So what we see here is that both the Ram Gallery and the Like Betsy exhibitions, they have a pronounced scope to focus attention on and to re rehabil rehabilitate a forgotten female artist left out of the masculine art historical canon. They ask the question, why did Eva Bullholte and Betsy Arkelot Berg disappear from the canon, and how should we reinsert them where they belong? But as you've seen, these, the chosen curatorial strategies were significantly different. The Eva Bullholte and Marte Lise Strambru exhibition was staged within the parameters of the quite conventional aesthetical gallery space of the White Cube. It had a minimalist design, it had no exhibition texts, and the art objects were installed to communicate visually across history and artistic medium. While the Like Betsy exhibition was staged as a, an activist exhibition, breaking boundaries of the White Cube in several ways, as we saw, hacking the exhibition with the quotes, mixing traditional oil painting with other art objects as textiles, ceramics, furniture, um, and these driftwood objects, and by designing objects as the Betsy Studio Box, uh, and also including uh, yeah, the porcelain and the furniture in the coffee shop. Also, they had, I forgot to mention, that they also had a postcard, uh, a postcard uh, table where people could, could meet and write down stories of the Betsy's, you know, the Betsy's they had known as a sort of a dissemination project to reflect upon who, who, you know, who does, you know, who does history include and who does history exclude, etc. Um, and as a third, as a fourth sort of strategy, um, none the least, they used the public space outside the gallery for this installation project, Han Roald as Betsy. Um, the Ram exhibition, as we saw, they wanted to tone down the all-women exhibition rehabilitation project by focusing on universal aesthetical qualities. Instead of gender issues, the more general term dialogue was chosen as a strategy. While the Northern Norwegian Kunstmuseum project actively sought to challenge the masculine canon by wishing to rehabilitate Betsy Akerslotberg and also wanting the exhibition to have an impact outside the gallery space. And even though the curatorial strategies were decidedly different, they both managed to create a debate, as you saw. 
The Like Bets exhibition was reported to the police for vandalism and its installation were attacked by the, poli by the, by the public. And the curator behind the RAM exhibition received angry emails from male art historians. And I can attest to this seminar discussion on canon rehabilitation being very heated and even unpleasant. Um, and to me, it was very surprising uh, that the apparently non-political strategy chosen by the RAM gallery still managed to provoke so much as it did. Um, and my conclusion is then that it seems to suggest that the All Women exhibition manages to provoke regardless of the chosen strategy, at least in these two examples. And it tells us that these exhibitions still need to take place. Thank you very much. <laughs>